Good morning and welcome to the NBA Daily for November 15th, 2024. Coming up, we got Sam Amick to talk about the Bucks and trying to figure things out and Denver's resurgence. We got Carter Rodriguez from the Chase Down podcast to talk about the Cavs and their 13-0 start. And Zena and I are going to take a look at some early season statistical trends and see if they're real or not. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Zena. Good morning, Sam Amick. We usually don't do this, but we're going to start the show with our guest because it's Sam. Sam, you know, you're basically part of the show at this point. Sam, our senior national NBA writer. How are you? Good, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, blessed to be here. Yeah. Um, you guys got to hang out the other night at Clay Night or Clay Day. I don't know how they Clay were. Day. Get it right. Clay Day, but it was at <laughs> night. So, you know, this is That's like true. Zena, <laughs> I, I got into my driveway at 2.45 in the morning. That did not feel like Clay Day. <laughs> you should have taken a boat. It you was know? a whole thing. Uh, exactly. Um, but you guys got a chance to hang out and catch up. I got a chance to see Sam not too long ago. So, you know, we're all familiar with each other. Uh, Sam, I want to talk about familiarity with the Bucks. Sure. This team has been together for a little while. They added Dame last year. Obviously, they changed coaches twice last season. We we've we don't have to go through the entire history. This season's not started the way that they expected it to. Number one, Chris Middleton's not been healthy. They've looked pretty old. They've had a lot of rotation issues. Now Damian Lillard's been out for a few days with some concussion issues. Uh, they have won two, two in a row. The second game took... 59 points from Giannis, and it took every single point and overtime to beat the Pistons. What's going on with the Bucks? Listen, uh, I mean, I hate to just kind of elephant in the room it, but it's just it's just not a, a very workable model. And, and this is what they thought was going to be a title contending team. The Giannis, Dame, Chris Middleton, Brooke Lopez, Bobby Portis. You know, going back to last year, Adrian Griffin formula has not worked. Um, the Middleton absence is big. You know what I mean? At his best, he's an important piece for them, an incredibly important piece. But I always feel like qualifying that because, A, like unfortunately for Chris, he's had health issues for so many years in a row now. The ankle surgeries in the offseason, we haven't seen him yet. Um, so if you tell me that he's going to get healthy and be back to his all-star self, I'm going to be skeptical of that. Uh, you know, Dame and Giannis have been putting up massive numbers. Um, but you know, they're just not a team that you look at and say, uh, they're anything, you know, remotely close to elite. And really, if you talk about body of work, if you go back to when doc rivers took over for Adrian last year, when the record wasn't all that bad and, and the bucks just decided to make that move, it's just a very, it's a bad stretch. You know what I mean? And, and obviously that's why as much as the bucks hate it, us in the media and fans are, are looking at Giannis and just kind of wondering, what it means because uh, this is a guy who is hungry to win another championship. He didn't want to just win one. And, uh, and right now it doesn't look like this group is capable of it. You're the perfect person to talk to about this because I think you were the person that wrote that article about the Bucks changing course this year, right? Changing perspective. Giannis changing perspective. Doc Rivers being excited about the team. Dame Lillard saying he's finally settled into Milwaukee right. finally. So he feels like this is going to be a change of course. And then most recently, you wrote a piece with Eric Nem about what's going on with the Bucks and the context leading up to this point. Guys, if you haven't read the article, go read it, because I think it's important to put this into context in terms of accountability. Who do we look to to blame for this situation? Because it's been a lot of lipstick on a pig um, since that blockbuster summer in which Chris Middleton, Lopez get resigned, Dame Lillard gets traded for, and it's just been lipstick on a pig, lipstick on a pig. Like internally, who, who do you look to, to try and fix this and, and take accountability for this? Honestly, Zena, I don't, my mind is, is just pulled in a bunch of directions. I don't mm. know who it's on. Like I yeah. don't, I'll start, I'm going to reverse engineer it. I okay. don't think it's Giannis. You know what I mean? I don't think it's him. And honestly, I, you know, I mean, then you get into things like, like Dame. Do I, I mean, Dame is doing what Dame does for the most part when he's been able to be out there, right. but the perimeter defense is a major issue and the age is a major issue uh, down low as well. You know, Brick Lopez is, is not the same guy he was a couple he's of years ago. Look old. Yeah. And, and yeah. that is what you hear scouts and, and other front office folks around the league talk about is that the age is the thing. And again, the uncomfortable truth here is, is that of all the people that we mentioned, Giannis is still, he is not old. He is in right. his prime. He's his prime, um, yeah. Yeah, and so the age of the team, you know, I can't sit here and pretend to tell you 
you know, that, that when it comes to doc, of course, the head coach is going to be accountable, but I can't admittedly tell you specifically, uh, you know, what he's been doing. That's not working. Um, mm. the health is a, is a massive thing. They, it's a, you see this in a couple other spots and I'll keep this brief, but you know, look at Philly, for example, they were so excited coming into the year and you're betting on, on, on players that are, who are calculated risks. You know, mm. uh, Joel is, is chief among them. He's up there with Kawhi Leonard. And when it comes to being a calculated risk, but Paul George is also one in his own right. Now Giannis for the most part finds a way to be healthy, but Chris Middleton is a calculated risk. And, you know, again, to go back to Dame, um, you know, this is who he is and they were supposed to build the defense around him in right, a way that would right. make up for his weaknesses. Yeah. So to me, it's a, it's a collaborative thing in, in all the wrong kind of ways. And they just, they don't look formidable. I mean, for Giannis to have to drop 59 and Detroit's had some plucky moments where you say, okay, they're more competitive than we thought, but still uh, that's the Detroit Pistons, you know, that you're yeah. talking about there. Hey, look, Drew Holiday also covered up a lot of uh, the lack of athleticism that they've had for years. And now yep. we're just seeing it. It's more apparent because it's Dame uh, at the point of attack. I want to swing over to Denver because the Nuggets uh, have looked better here recently, especially, but better than any of us expected coming into the season, given the the two bad summers that they've had uh, as far as you know roster construction goes. It helps when you've got the best player in the world and Nikola Jokic, and he's averaging Someone called it a, a 30 point triple dozen because it's 30, 12 and 12. I mean, I like it's that. Ca- kind I of like absurd, <laughs> right? Yeah. But now I, we can, I don't want to get into the workload stuff. That's for later on in the season if they start to struggle. But for right now, like this is working. Christian Brown has been awesome. And uh, frankly, like uh, when do we get to the point where we say, okay, well, Calvin Booth actually was right. I mean, I think you got to get deeper into the season, of course. Uh, but, but the Christian Brown thing is going to be a, a really pivotal subplot all the way through the season because, you know, the choice to let Contavious Caldwell Pope walk to Orlando one year after Bruce Brown got away, you know, the narrative obviously became that the Nuggets just weren't willing to, to pay up for these veterans and that Calvin was leaning into his prospects in the kind of way that was, again, I'll use that phrase, calculated risk that you saw some of his vision for some of these young guys. But if you're Michael Malone and, and that crew, you're looking at it going, man, these boys better figure it out real quick because we won a title a couple of years ago and I'm not about to sit here and be patient. And this is the Julian Strothers of the world, you know, uh, Peyton Watson, those guys. So Christian though is the top player on that list. And I have his game log in front of me. Uh, when you're talking about, you know, uh, shooting, what is it here? We've got 56% from three, uh, going back to the beginning of the month, um, you know, not high volume, almost four per game, but combined with what he does as a defensive player, a two way player, uh, averaging almost 18 a game last year, guys, I, I wrote a piece and talked to Calvin about the nuggets and their vision. And I will tell you as a media guy, one thing I love about Calvin, he's not afraid to, to give you his honest opinion and to put himself out there. He is the one who actually back then uh, essentially made a comparison between Christian and none other than Jimmy Butler and talked about like thinking that now that is a hell of a hyper, you know, hyperbolic statement. Uh, But, but even if he's, you know, 60% Jimmy Butler, that's going to work for the nuggets as a role player. But the point is you at least know the level of belief that Calvin has in Christian uh, and why truthfully, if you then look at what KCP is doing so far this year, uh, you know, if you just went kind of side by side, you know, uh, you know, Christian is, is getting the better of that matchup at this point. And without it, I mean, the Joker needs help. We know the whole story there. He's the best player in the game, probably the, the MVP front runner again right now after what he's been doing the last couple of weeks. I know it's really early. And so that the pressure is going to be there on the Nuggets, their front office, ownership, coaching staff, all the way through Joker's prime. Uh, and again, Christian is a big part of it. Well, uh, we're kind of out of time, so we'll let you go, Sam. But uh, I know you'll be back soon because uh, December 15th is right around the corner. Not that that's a super important day for all these teams that are struggling, but we're keeping an eye on it. Coming up after the break, Carter Rodriguez from the Chase Down Pod is going to join us to talk about the Cavs and how they got to 13 and up. One of the early season's best stories, the Cleveland Cavaliers are now 13 and 0. And Zeno, we could have just done a whole segment where we talked about how good they were, just us. Right. But we decided to reach out to our friend Carter Rodriguez from the Chase Down podcast, the best Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Actually, 
one of like two that I know. So oh, it, it's a thriving community, David. <laughs> it is. Hey, the Cavs are back. Carter, you're back. Welcome to the NBA Daily. It's good to see your face. Uh, I'm going to give you a lot of credit for sticking with the Cavs during the down years, as I always do. This team has been rebuilt from the ashes that were left behind of the LeBron years. You've got Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell, the two headed attack uh, guards. And you've got the two headed attack bigs and Evan Mobley and Jared Allen. Everything coming together. How much of this early season success are you going to place at the feet of Kenny Atkinson? Well, he certainly has to get quite a bit of credit, right? I mean, he is the only material difference uh, with this roster year over (laughs) year, uh, though that is uh, probably Ty Jerome Slander, who missed most of last year with an injury and has been the best backup point guard in basketball. But, you know, Kenny has taken a team and, uh, you know, that we kind of thought we knew. Uh, that's the kind of trick we play on ourselves when a team sticks together for a couple of years. We just think we know everything there is to yeah. know about them. Right. And then all of a sudden, just a different context, a different voice. And uh, they are a pretty fundamentally different team. I mean, this is uh, the best offense in basketball. And offense has really been the question about this team over the past three years of this core operating together. And they are firing on all, all cylinders. They're playing fast. I want to say they're second in the league in points per possession and transition. They're like seventh in transition frequency. They're running a lot more. Uh, they are playing a much deeper rotation. Kenny mm-hmm. is a guy who loves to play 10, 11 guys, whereas JB, anytime it got past eight, you could tell he was kind of tugging at his <laughs> collar like, all right, this is a little much. I don't want to play this many guys. So uh, they are playing fast. They are playing uh, a more democratized style of basketball uh, where, you know, last year it was Darius and Donovan leading the team and put touches per game by a mile, like 20 more than uh, than third place this year. It's Darius leading the team. And then Evan Mobley in second place. Donovan Mitchell is third on his team in touches. So this, this has been crazy. A, yeah, this has been a materially different Cavaliers team. Uh, year over year, despite having the same personnel and so much of it, I think you have to lay at the at the feet of Kenny Atkinson. You know, uh, we heard going into camp that he was running, uh, you know, some practices with an 18 second shot clock just to say, go, go, go. Wow. Like you have to, you know, you have to materially play different in practice. So you play uh, that differently in a game setting. And like, I think that change, you know, the ways he's uh, he's utilizing everyone in the offense. I mean, the results speak for themselves. That's kind of like how I try to listen to podcasts on 2X so that I can retain the information a little <laughs> oh, bit yeah. faster. And I also, as you mentioned, like Kenny Atkinson playing a 10-11 man rotation. I wonder where he may have gotten that from. <laughs> huh. Sounds like his counterpart in the West is just leaving remains all around the NBA. But you talk about that pace and you talk about Darius Garland. Like he is the catalyst behind the way that they're running, playmaking in transition, being able to find his bigs. Like how much of a growth has been attributed to his own personal growth versus him and Donovan really figuring it out in terms of working together on the, in the back, in the backcourt. Well, I I think it's no secret that last year was a bit of a lost season for Darius and, you know, both in terms of the play and even in the style of the play that the team kind of needed to adapt. Like if you look at the usage in the postseason last year, Darius was functionally playing shooting guard. And it's like, if if, if he's going to be just like an off ball guy that sometimes gets it, like, then the the entire experiment doesn't really work. Like both guys have to be dynamic on ball players, or you might as well play a more conventional backcourt with more conventional size. And the fact that he has returned to form, the fact that his three point attempt rate is up like nine or ten percent year over year, and the floater game, I've, he's like a seventy percent on floaters right now. I mean, he yeah. is. He is scoring at all three levels at a really high level. He his burst is back. He's playing the best on ball defense of his career. And, you know, I think Donovan has just been so, you know, I don't think Donovan really could share the, you know, could share in the offense last year because I don't know if Darius was able to kind of play at the level that warranted it, if we're really being honest. Yeah, that's true. I agree. Over the course of Darius's career, uh, my co-host Justin Rowan and I have always talked about Darius being kind of the, the floor and the ceiling raiser for the offense. Um, because he is the, you know, he's a true point guard. You know, I yeah. think sometimes around the league, people talk about him as more of a scorer, but this is a guy who the team has begged to shoot more when he's open because he loves to pass the ball. He loves to play connective basketball. And I think when he's got the keys to the offense, it, it, he really is a tide that raises all boats. Yeah. You, you mentioned some of his crazy shooting numbers to start the year. I mean, the team overall is leading the league in three point shooting, like 42% almost. Um, I, okay. That's not sustainable. We know that. Number two offense in the league. 
Do you buy the offense? Because I, I feel like a lot of it is predicated on the shooting. I mean, you go through the numbers and you say, okay, they're not top 10 in three-point attempts. I mean, it, you know, we talked about the pace and it, and it is up there, but the shooting is absurd right now. And it's going to come back down to earth. Like, is this offense still going to be, you know, oh, ye of top little five faith. Or six? Uh, hey, uh, I'm uh, just saying, uh, you know, it's a small sample size, you know, 13 sure. games and they are just blistering. Right. Now. Let me be the devil on your shoulder real quick, because, <laughs> you know, this is a team that Darius Garland, well, re- well renowned as one of the best three point shooters in basketball. Yeah. Donovan Mitchell has become one of the best three point shooters in basketball. Um, you know, George Niang, Sam Merrill. A lot of the volume that, that this team is getting are from guys who are career high 30 percent three point shooters. This is a team whose I thought their percentages kind of underperformed their volume last year. Mm -hmm. where they got a lot of shots up last year. They actually are shooting less threes this year than they were last year uh, per 100 possessions, but their percentages just really weren't there. I feel like this is a team that is funneling shots to their best shooters. Now, is Karis LeVert going to shoot 56% from three or whatever he's at right now? Uh, Unlikely. However, they're also missing one of their best shooters in Max Struess, who hasn't played all year. So, you know, yes, it's going to come down to earth. Of course it is. Uh, You did note uh, the three-point rate isn't insane. Uh, Shouts to Ethical Hoops. This team is uh, (laughs) uh, tops in the league without uh, spamming threes or spamming free throw attempts. Um, But on the other end of the floor, they've been one of the least lucky teams in the league in terms of opponent three-point percentage. There was a two-game stretch where Jose Alvarado and A.J. Green went like 14 of 15 against them. You know, Uh, so like I think even if they give up a little bit on the offensive end and settle in six, seven, eight in the league, I think that's a compromise I'm pretty comfortable with, given that I think the defense probably has a little room to grow. Now, thinking about that defense, you know, it's anchored in the paint, at least by Evan Mobley. I mean, this guy, you've talked about this on your most recent podcast. I listen to Draymond Green's podcast as well. Just talking about how good of a player Evan Mobley is. I have been quoted on this podcast to say, I think he was worth the money. Um, And he's growing in that direction of just being one of the best bigs, most active down the court bigs like is this the year Evan Mobley is making the leap? Has he made the leap? In you know, you know, I've always felt like his leap w- was going to present itself in 10 percent growth increments because he okay. just didn't have as much room as a lot of young guys do when they come into the league to get better. Like when you come out of the box as, a, you know, an, a defensive player of the year candidate, mm. like just as a rookie, as right. a 21 year old, like your room for growth to get to star level player, just it's less of a goal. So I've always felt like people looking for like the Omega leap that, you know, certain players get, you know, take year over year, like an Ann Edwards or something like that. I always thought that was probably an unfair thing to even ask from mm-hmm. him in the first place. However, he is he's taking a leap. All that couching, he's taking a leap. I mean, he yeah. is already yeah. uh, he's already run more pick and rolls this season than he did all of last season combined. Yeah. Uh, he is grabbing and going. Uh, they, they've got a few pet actions with him as a ball handler. They love having Sam Merrill set a, a screen for him at the elbow and then mm-hmm. slip out to three. That's an action that's just so hard for teams to deal with. Um, he is playing stronger, more physical. He just I, he's just added some grown it, man strength. He's not getting stood up as much when he no. attacks from the right. wing um, with the ball in his hands, which is great. Um, quickly, bef- before we go, they get it to 15 and 0. Do you think they make it 15 and 0? I think they do. Uh, they really want to. They care about the NBA Cup this year, and that's yeah. their next game against uh, against Chicago. So that trap game uh, on a Sunday. Oh, Chicago's uh, tough. And Did Chicago was they, tough yeah. against them. Yeah, yeah. Chicago's yeah. Chicago tough, and then the Hornets uh, should be a win. But you know, they. I would not. Forget, I would not blame for the them if they're ball. looking ahead. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I, I think they got a great shot, and boy, would I love to see it. That's awesome. Well, Carter Rodriguez, Chase Down Podcast. Go and check it out. Stick around after the break. Zena and I are going to take a look at some early season statistics and see which of them feel real. We're only about 12 games into the NBA season. It doesn't feel like very long, but secretly it actually 12 games is a lot. We're still in the small sample size theater portion of the season, though. Uh, 12 games, you're going to have, you know, crazy stats like Christian Brown's like been shooting like 56% from three the last month, as Sam Amick told us. Right. Uh, things, you know, just statistical aberrations. So I thought it would be a good time to check in on some teams and play a little bit of that Goldilocks game that we like to play around here. So you I'm going to give you some net ratings for some teams with their record. Mm-hmm. And I want you to mm-hmm. tell me, Zena, if this feels just right, too high 
or too low? That's what we got to okay. figure out because some of these I, I think are dead on and, and, you know, match the eye test. Some of them a little bit striking. I want to start with the Indiana Pacers. They're five and six right now. We know that they've struggled a little bit. Mm. Minus three and a half net rating. How does that feel to you, Zena? I mean, again, we were, we're watching these games every single night and, you know, they have been struggling. I, I feel like actually that's just right. Feels um, about right. You know, they are an offensive focused team, but that offense has not been as highly productive as it used to be. Ty Halliburton hasn't been producing the kind of games that we've expected out of him. Um, Benedict Matherin has kind of cleaned up a little bit of that by having some high off high octane games, but their defense has always just been lackluster. Yeah. I mean, so, again, the, the I two best say, teams, the two most fun teams to watch any night last season was the Pacers and whoever they played. Absolutely. Do you guys remember the NBA cup last year, the in season tournament before it became the NBA cup? Like those Pacers were high flying action. It didn't matter if you came to see a competitive game, like you came to see the, the Pacers just go crazy uh, and just high fly throughout the, the entire arena. So yeah, it's not the same. It's not the same energy this year. Yeah. So I think that uh, three and a half negative three and a half fits. It's a big Denver Nuggets show. So let's, let's stick with them. Denver Nuggets seven mm. and three right now, mm -hmm. 2.7. Plus 2.7 net rating for, yeah. for the Nuggets. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. Yes. Um, They've had a lot of close games, and Jokic has had to pull a lot of these out, including That's overtime. exactly what I was going to say. That, that positive is going to be Jokic um, at the end of the day. And he's also positive from a, a defensive perspective around the paint. Not so bad either. But overall, their defense on the outside, I think, hasn't been as strong as they probably would have liked, particularly in that second unit. When you're thinking Russell Westbrook comes yeah. out there and, and Dario Sarge comes out there, et cetera. So Jokic, high pro producing on offense, balanced out by the fact that their defense has been a little bit safe. All right. And and the last one, this one is interesting. The, the New York Knicks, they've struggled quite a bit. We, we've documented the defensive struggles uh, on this show, especially Carl Anthony Towns around the rim has just been awful. They're five and six net rating plus 4.2, which is shocking. That that feels yeah. too <laughs> Do high, see, doesn't it? You see my face, right? Oh my that's God. that's OK. In the Golden Rocks game, look, that's we made way this too game up and it surprised really? me. Really? That yes. actually I did. I didn't know that. Um, wow. Good I mean, they lost, <laughs> look, they lost a really tough game against the Bulls yeah. where I mean, Jalen Brunson hit two and a half game winners. The the, right. the actual game winner was in and out and they have just lost some heart, heartbreakers. But yeah, um, again, but when you think about it, when you actually break it down, it's true. Did Carl Anthony Towns had four, 40 point game the other night. Like he's been putting yeah. up some crazy numbers. It feels like he's finally fitting into the offense with the Knicks. Uh, Jalen Brunson is always going to just have a rough game, but to, he's going to get his points. Right. It's just not going to be easy that he's getting his points. Yeah. Um, I mean, problems all I been on the defensive end for them. I, well, I mean, they've got some offensive shooting issues, but man, if they if they solve the defensive end, this team could be what we thought they might be coming into the season. It's not over yet. It's still early, Zena, and they mm. probably they got some moves to make. I think I don't know. We don't know. Uh, that's going to do it for today's show, folks. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks to Sam Amick and Carter Rodriguez for stopping by. Uh, thanks to, to Zena for hanging out all week. You guys have a good weekend. Uh, for Zena Kata, I'm Dave DeFore, and this has been the NBA Daily. Thanks for waking up with us. Mm -hmm.